bright minds and we start quite a uh, quick probably because the time is not so much with Matilde Cassani tonight and I would um, briefly uh, say some words about you, Matilde. Matilde studied architecture in Milan and in Barcelona and her practice uh, reflects the special implication of cultural pluralism in the contemporary Western urban context. She often moves on the border between architecture, installation, and event design. Her works have been showcased in many cultural institutions, galleries, and published in several magazines. She has been a resident fellow at Academy Schloss Solitude in Stuttgart and at the Headland, uh, Headland Center for the Arts in San Francisco. Storefront for Art and Architecture in New York hosted her exhibition Separate Spaces in Profane Buildings in September 2011. I'm reflecting on the date. It was quite crucial. Yes. Wow. Yeah. She moreover designed the National Pavilion of the King Kingdom of Bahrain at the uh, 13th Venice Architecture Biennial and uh, in 2012, uh, sorry, yes, in 2012, and she took part of the 14th uh, Venice Architecture Biennial uh, within the exhibition that was called Mondo Italia with the piece Countryside Worship that I hope to yes. see and uh, show today after uh, after acquired by the Victorian London Museum in London. So um, yeah, I will not spend more more than this to give you the stage. Yeah, we can start with the. Uh, presentation. Probably it would be nice to switch off the light again. And then everyone's going to shake not so yeah. Hi everybody. So thanks so much for the invite and thanks for, so much for the introductions. Uh, it's very good to be uh, after Ipo because he somehow uh, tackled some uh, uh, some geographical areas and some aspects of my work, uh, so I think it's a good uh, connection, you will see. Uh, I tried to select uh, some of the pieces I've done uh, in the former past uh, regarding authenticity, and I tried to make a connection uh, with my work. And uh, I will start uh, with this project, uh, which uh, somehow deals with the display of authenticity uh, in a very literal way. And uh, it's called Background, and was the 2013 participation of the uh, Kingdom, Kingdom of Bahrain at the Venice Biennale. Uh, that was a very crucial moment because uh, Bahrain was reached by the Arab Spring. Uh, so it was a very tense moment for the country, a country that was uh, undergoing a series of uh, riots and um, a lot of uh, human rights issues. And <coughs> so for this reason, it was very difficult for a country like Bahrain to appear in a very uh, let's say, usually a very uh, proud, mo proud moment uh, for a country, such as the Venice Biennale, which normally display, of course, critical issues about your country, but it's very difficult to, let's say, uh, actually uh, display who you are in that moment. Uh, this project was done uh, together with Francesco Librizzi and Sembra Tropea, we were free, and was commissioned by Mural Sayer um, from Palestine, but actually based in Bahrain. Uh, as you can see, these images here, they look like abstract paintings, but they were actually graffitis that were cancelled by the municipality uh, during the demonstrations. Um, and uh, um, as you can see, zooming in, every day uh, tires were burning and also graffiti were constantly uh, raised from, uh, from the streets. Uh, we were asked to design uh, the pavilion at the Venice Biennale without actually uh, visiting the country. So we had to somehow uh, imagine what we uh, could never imagine. Um, and so together with the curator, we started thinking on how, uh, when you don't know anything about uh, uh, context, uh, especially uh, if it's very complex, you just get the idea or a scenario of a specific place just by looking at the so uh, the title of the pavilion was actually background and was dealing with uh, um, this idea of an image you create in your mind uh, which is based on the pieces of uh, images you got from, from for instance, the, the media. 
And Bahrain is also quite an unusual country and it's very difficult uh, to get more information. So, so we started by uh, selecting in the media the moments in which Bahrain became extremely famous, such as the moment in which uh, Michael Jackson moved uh, to Bahrain to live there for two years, or uh, the initial landing of the Concorde uh, flight, which is very noisy and extremely uh, dangerous, and only Bahrain accepted to, uh, to, to, to make it land. And also, of course, the Formula One tournament uh, and uh, land reclamations, uh, the ones we see also in the other um, uh, Arab Emirates. Um, the pavilion was uh, extremely uh, basic in its design and was simply a tool uh, to, uh, to dis display and describe our message. Uh, we basically um, replicated the existing opening of the pavilion, so the doors and the windows, uh, and we overlapped them uh, with the, uh, these uh, large uh, arches, the panels, wooden panels, um, that we used as a surface to project uh, video, some videos. Uh, these videos uh, were simply um, real-time images uh, of a TV security camera placed in one uh, random building in Bahrain and were basically uh, actually uh, uh, substituting the Venice uh, panorama with Amanama panorama, which is the capital of Bahrain. So we simply overlapped two landscapes and we basically simultaneously uh, make the time, uh, sp uh, the time pass in Venice and in Manama. So uh, all these doors were simply displaying at the different directions uh, what was happening in a random place of the city. We couldn't control the images, so it was simply a flux of images taken by these cameras uh, for 24 hours. So when was uh, day in Venice was also day in Bahrain, and when was night in, uh, in Bahrain was also night in Venice. And uh, <coughs> so basically the projections were, uh, were boring and nothing special was happening. Uh, but let's say the message was to understand the background as uh, something that can become the foreground uh, in case you want to, um, to deal with uh, a clear message or with an authentic message. So here you have, uh, and the pavilion was almost empty, you had only these doors and uh, these panels and a uh, few seats that were quite uncomfortable for very short stays. So this is uh, supposed to be a video, but it's not working. And uh, uh, in terms of uh, pursuing authenticity, I will start with uh, this very uh, extensive research of mine. I started back in 2007 and I'm still obsessed with. Uh, which is uh, the research on sacred spaces in contemporary Western context. So, um, this all started when I visited in 2007 this very uh, small village in the middle of the Italian flatland called Novellara. Novellara is home of a large number of immigrants that are dealing with the uh, agricultural uh, nature of, uh, of the area. Uh, we can say that nowadays it's almost 50% immigrants and 50% uh, locals. And that uh, the, the small city, which has 20,000 people, uh, was already lots of different uh, religious buildings. Uh, for me, it was completely striking to, uh, to see this scene uh, the day I left uh, Milano to uh, take a train to, to this little village. And <coughs> uh, the image you see here, it's the day of the celebration. Uh, the celebration is called the Vaisakhi. The Vaisakhi is the celebration uh, connected with the harvest. It's the harvest festival in Punjab, India, where all the Sikhs come from. And uh, uh, it's every year celebrated in this village and brings all together all the community working in the immediate surroundings. So uh, the scene was quite uh, strong to me and uh, made me understand how powerful and how strong actually uh, the demonstration of identity could, uh, could become in a, in a host country and how uh, public spaces uh, uh, designed in a very, let's say, Italian way or let's say mimicking Italian positions, such as for instance the soccer field, um, uh, would uh, suit perfectly uh, the function of hosting the rituals, uh, such as the ritual uh, lunch in which they sit in rows facing each other, uh, women and men, and they use the center of the field as a reference to make a parallel lines of, of people. And this brought me to, uh, to a larger question, which is 
uh, this research I started in Barcelona called Second Interior Simple Pain Buildings. Um, for me, uh, the point was to understand how uh, religious pluralism uh, would impact the contemporary city and where were the places in which this would manifest itself. Uh, so at that time I was in Barcelona studying a, a postgraduate degree at the SSCB and I decided to, to start this research. At that time, uh, internet was not, I mean, internet was there, but these uh, places were not mapped anywhere, uh, not even the municipality knew. So I decided to map uh, one by one uh, what I called second spaces in profane buildings, which were uh, simply interiors that were transformed uh, in second spaces. So secular settings transformed into second spaces to at least accommodate the most the necessity of the ritual, of the prayers. So I started with doors and I <laughs> decided to understand if it was visible from the outside. Uh, for instance, the three at uh, the bottom are three mosques uh, that uh, one are, uh, is in Arabic, the other one doesn't have any specific sign, but this uh, uh, little shape here uh, reminds uh, of the Mirhab, which is the uh, Muslim altar, and this is bilingual but quite, uh, quite difficult to, to, to get. And then again, starting re uh, researching uh, deeper, I understood that there was always a commercial activity next to these places, and uh, in this case, the butcher was also the owner of the religious space uh, and also the, the person in charge of collecting the money to renovate the mosque and also uh, sometimes acting as imam during Fridays. So uh, there was this extremely uh, strong connection between uh, commerce, religious observance and uh, uh, the, the, the community. And of course, uh, uh, this was all a result of a strategy to avoid an official registration, which is quite complicated. At that time, a law was, quite, was, was being updated, uh, because still, uh, at that time, you could not build any other religious building out of churches from, uh, from the municipal uh, regulations. So uh, by calling these places not religious buildings, but simply cultural associations, you, you would avoid uh, any official uh, any official uh, uh, registration, any official control from the municipality. Um, and these places were growing from simply one small room um, that was basically multi-layered and multifunctional, in which uh, the community would pray but also do anything else, uh, such as uh, gather for peace, for parties, uh, teaching languages, uh, giving, uh, I don't know, suggestions regarding the, uh, the same permit, uh, etc. So we're really a sort of uh, performative uh, piece of land. And these are some images I took at that time. Uh, of, uh, For instance, this is a Sikh temple in Cayo Hospital um, in, uh, in the center of Barcelona. And uh, as, uh, let's say, as an architectural background, I, I was really obsessed on trying to understand how to sacralize a space, uh, so how to rent a shop and transform it into a temple. Uh, so for the first thing I did was to detect uh, the few elements that could uh, uh, correspond to a necessity or to a geometrical necessity of the space, uh, such as, for instance, the place for, uh, for shoes and the place for the ritual lunch, which you see, again, people is sitting in rows and facing each other, uh, just given by a tablecloth on the floor. And then the kitchen simultaneously standing next to the altar where the, the priests were, uh, were performing the news. And here uh, I tried to create this list of minimum second features that were somehow the, the minimal necessities uh, of transformations uh, of transformation of a spare, uh, of a spare that would make a second space, uh, a profane space into a second. And uh, these are some abstracts from, uh, uh, from the research I've done, and this was an article published in Domus, in which I was uh, numbering uh, um, all the elements that were actually uh, useful uh, for, for the prayers, uh, such as digital clocks, uh, uh, carpets, uh, and uh, the places for abortions, and so on, and how the body would perform. And this was the first result of this, uh, uh, of this uh, fascination I had, which uh, was a series of boxes in, in, in which I actually placed all the objects that were given to me by the communities while visiting them. So are uh, very poor plastic or uh, very cheap tin uh, objects that in the moment they were placed inside these kind of places, they would become sacred. So um, su 
super pop and super simple objects that were perfectly suitable uh, for the ritual. Uh, so I, would go, I wouldn't go into a deep uh, um, uh, discussion about this, but I would just uh, um, show how uh, each one was basically geometrically uh, translating uh, the, the necessity of ritual uh, through the body and also through the objects. Uh, this and this uh, quite modernist approach uh, then uh, became um, this book called Sacred Interiors and Profane Buildings that uh, uh, was uh, uh, a strong statement in which you had this very strong uh, coffee cover and inside you had this, uh, these images of these uh, tiny and uh, dusty places as was visiting at the time. Um, this project uh, became larger uh, once uh, then did the exhibition and I was invited in 2012 to do the same research for, uh, uh, for New York. And of course uh, uh, it's impossible to compare Barcelona to New York, especially in terms of scale, but also in terms of my understanding of, uh, uh, of, the, of the city environment. So uh, for this reason, these are some images of the show, I decided to create, create a sort of crowdsourced crowd research uh, that made me understand how uh, let's say the, 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 the path of insertion of this kind of sacred spaces were, was the same exactly uh, in Europe as in the US. So the US has a, has a much uh, older history of migration and a much older history of openness, but uh, the, let's say the process of uh, insertion of these places was pretty much the same. Here you have some images from the 60s in which in Brooklyn people was praying on carpets. And uh, in Manhattan, again, you see this, uh, which is exactly what you see now at the moment uh, in Europe. Uh, but uh, what I understood and what I uh, detected was that, that, uh, that there's a moment in which the symbols uh, uh, come, come out from, from the building. So what you saw uh, in Europe uh, were still interiors, and here uh, you, you can see that the building, for instance, this one is a mosque, um, undergone a series of uh, uh, renovations uh, and additions, uh, such as uh, the dome, as you can see here, and this building uh, next to it. So, uh, still not uh, possible to uh, understand it as a second space, but, uh, but yet uh, containing some pictures. Um, again, these little crosses around, and probably this is the example in which you see uh, the building altered the most. It's, uh, it's a supermarket. AT&T supermarket transformed into a new temple in Minnesota. Uh, uh, and here you have uh, some pictures of the interiors in which you see the interiors were altered the most uh, to actually host all the necessities of uh, the ritual. This uh, building is very famous for the community also because it even became, uh, let's say, a place for uh, a pilgrimage. So you can also, instead of going um, going to India, you can also go to this temple and there's a model of the Himalayas in which two, two rivers are crossing and if you go there it's kind of valid as a pilgrimage. <laughs> um, and also I understood that uh, uh, the process is the same but also that buildings uh, have a memory that can last longer than uh, one generation uh, of uh, sacred spaces and can even be a third generation uh, temples. For instance, this is a Sikh temple that was previously a mosque and previously an Orthodox church. Um, because community found out that it was very easy to actually uh, inherit a building instead of building a new one and uh, asking for permission. So there's a sort of mutual agreement between the communities. Again, uh, pictures of, uh, of the interiors uh, of, the, of the Sikh temple uh, I took at the time, in which you see uh, here some offerings, which are uh, the money uh, used uh, to enlarge the building. So compared to what we saw in the previous pictures in Barcelona, from one room we got to a proper, let's say, parish, in which you have uh, the place for prayer, the kitchen, uh, the kindergarten and everything useful for the community to, to perform uh, their uh, traditions. So, and uh, uh, zooming out very quickly, uh, far out, we see that uh, the city, uh, a city like New York, is completely filled uh, with these very tiny uh, little uh, interiors uh, that were uh, modified. And if you zoom in at the bottom of the island, you see that there's uh, plenty. Here, this is where all the places are also for architecture, where I did the show. And uh, a 
again uh, zooming out and just by highlighting with numbers uh, the places I found, you basically reconstruct uh, the geography of the city. So uh, just by highlighting uh, the sacred spaces in profane buildings, uh, you can basically rebuild the map of Manhattan, of Queens and, and Brooklyn. So, um, Basically, this was the manifesto of the show, uh, which, uh, let's say, unveiled uh, what I could gather as information, as data. So it's not even a complete map. It's simply uh, a sort of demonstrative uh, action. And uh, when uh, OMA called me uh, upon to uh, give a very uh, documentary image of Italy um, in a very, uh, let's say, um, and the way I decided to, to go back to my favorite uh, little village in Italy. So I decided to travel back to Novellara and check again uh, the celebration I, I found at the time. And uh, <coughs> with architectures made of people, I mean that uh, <coughs> uh, there's a moment uh, in this uh, very little uh, rural setting in which you uh, can understand a much wider system of connection, territories, architectures, uh, and development uh, that you can normally uh, not get. So uh, the usual uh, image of the main square of Novellara, it's this one, that uh, suddenly can become this one um, uh, during uh, the Vaisaki, in which all the community from the, from the rural uh, smaller houses uh, come to the main square. So use the public space, as a, a center for the celebration. So uh, I took these images together with uh, the Pino Sistolegnani, photographer, and uh, um, you, you can see this is the, the, the mass coming from the temple. So uh, Novellara is a Sikh temple, the first one built in Italy in 2000. And this uh, basically reveals a wider territory in which you don't only have one Gurbara in Italy, but you have around 40 only in the Italian flatland. So it's, complete, it's a completely rural phenomena and it's extremely excessive. Uh, so each of these orange flags is actually indicating one of these temples and is actually hosting uh, one of these celebrations. So, so the Baitak is not only celebrated in Novellara, but in all these villages uh, the same way. And this process appears also that these kind of settings are actually uh, uh, completely uh, altered in the interiors uh, to host uh, uh, the religious uh, uh, setting. And in the moment of the feast, they become even uh, more uh, striking. Than, uh, the <laughs> mm, so the piece I've done for the Biennale uh, was uh, a very large lenticular print. The lenticular print is a printing te technique that allows uh, to uh, to print two images on the same surface uh, and allows to, uh, to see them in two different moments. So basically this very large um, photograph uh, was actually um, oh, the, the result of the overlapping of the square completely empty and the square completely filled, as you saw at the beginning of, of, uh, of this uh, presentation here. It's very difficult to take pictures of this piece because it's, uh, it's impossible to, to detect the two moments, but uh, uh, from far away you could see the square completely empty, and once you approach the square you would see uh, filling it up with, uh, with the people from the celebration. And that was the back side in which you had the, the beginning of the procession, where people were starting from the temple, crossing, crossing the agricultural fields, uh, to get to, to, the, to the proper public spaces of the city to celebrate uh, the event. Again, some images from the far. And this, uh, of course, reveals how the city is completely uh, perused. And this uh, small shelf was simply adding uh, a quick uh, um, diagram on how you can build a Burbara in Italy, in a country that uh, doesn't allow other religions and doesn't have an agreement with other religions uh, uh, regarding the construction of a sacred space. And how this basically, it's always a procedure that uh, results ad hoc in, accord, uh, in accordance with the municipality or with the mayor or with some, um, some political people. Uh, these events uh, are uh, not uh, cheap at all and are extremely uh, massively attended and are extremely expensive, uh, such as the one in Brescia in which we even have an helicopter throwing um, uh, petals of roses uh, to, uh, through, the, through, the, through the celebration. Uh, I will uh, go on by showing an 
another project which uh, uh, I try to uh, even with a little bit of arrogance uh, to uh, reinvent the authenticity of, uh, of a place. Uh, of course, when I, I, I talk about authenticity, I probably also mean identity and how identity modifies and uh, re uh, revitalized through time, uh, especially when uh, cultures are hybridized and when uh, uh, the context in which uh, things are happening is not the context uh, where things were uh, born or traditional uh, per se. Uh, that, uh, this was done uh, last year for the Oslo Architecture Triennale and uh, I was commissioned to work on Prato, on the uh, textile uh, production of Prato. Uh, Prato is a city that has undergone a very big crisis during the 60s and uh, <coughs> basically was completely repopulated and reorganized um, uh, afterwards uh, by the advent of uh, a very large number of uh, Chinese uh, manufacturers that took uh, the basic infrastructure of the city, made of little uh, buildings uh, that had uh, a ground floor uh, with production and an upper floor uh, residential, normally family-owned businesses, and transporting to a very large uh, market of production of pronto moda, what is called the pronto moda. Pronto moda is uh, the design, production, and selling of clothes uh, for a very cheap price in the same setting, so in the same little um, business. And this was uh, completely invented by, by the Chinese and it's completely uh, uh, done and uh, used by, by the Chinese. And it's important to say that it's uh, based in Prato, Italy, uh, first because it's the perfect infrastructure and secondly also because being based in Italy, you can produce uh, with the Chinese manufacturers you can have cheap labor, but also uh, you can put on, on the cloth the tag with the Made in Italy sign, which somehow probably still adds a little bit of value to the clothes. Um, this uh, was not at all to me something that we can be intended as uh, violent uh, from the Chinese community, but the Prato, uh, the Prato, all the textile producers that were already in, in crisis uh, didn't take it uh, with peace. So the city, I wouldn't say under those uh, conflict, but I would say that uh, there's a division between Italians and, uh, and Chinese. And so what I did was to try to detect how the advent uh, of a new community uh, had influenced the image of the city. And I started from an extremely traditional object, which every Italian city has, which is the gonfalone. The gonfalone is the flag that uh, represents uh, the city uh, and includes a series of symbols that were traditionally included in the flag that normally uh, represent uh, the rich families or the production typical from the area or let's say uh, um, an episode related to the history of the place that's pretty relevant uh, for, the, for the city. And again, I decided to use the celebration days as, as, as the moment in which you can actually access a larger territory. Uh, so I followed the, the Chinese lagoon from the, from the city center up to the periphery. And uh, these are some images taken from, uh, from the event in which uh, it's basically the only moment in which you can enter this uh, production space because there's been uh, there a lot of tension. Uh, uh, it's not uh, possible to enter and to visit the production sites. But in the days of the celebrations, if you follow the dragoon, the dragoon is actually uh, entering each and every building to, um, uh, to, um, bless. To, bless, to bless the building and the business itself. Uh, so a small altar is placed inside and a red carpet uh, full of uh, firecrackers um, allows the dragoon to enter and uh, fastly uh, get out and go to the next one. So it's a very strong moment, uh, but let's say it's a moment of complete openness that uh, allows, uh, again, to understand not only uh, the type of production, but also uh, the position of these places, which are not only related to the city center of Prato, but are including all the uh, immediate periphery and all the small villages around the city. So Prato now is no longer, let's say, a city, but it's more like a territory uh, with a diffused system of uh, clothes production. 
that serves all the uh, European countries and markets. And uh, I think it's quite interesting to see a sort of parallelism between what we saw in Novellara and what we saw here, uh, that uh, um, no one is around, and, uh, and this, but the streets are crowded and uh, it's always quite, uh, quite a strong image. This can be compared with La Picoverata, which is the typical feast of Prato, uh, in which the mayor is offering watermelons to the citizenship, normally uh, during the August 15, so the Ferragosto. Uh, it's a medieval uh, tradition that uh, was brought up until now, and that became, let's say, a motivation of controversy uh, in, the, in the recent past, because uh, it's very much appreciated by the Chinese community, and so this became um, a moment of tension. And this feast, for a few years, was transformed uh, into something different, so it was moved elsewhere, not, uh, no longer um, done in the, the main fountain, but elsewhere. And the offering was no longer watermelons, but uh, Cantucci and Vinsanto instead, as a sort of eviction uh, strategy. <laughs> Only recently, uh, the feast was re-included into the city calendar, and uh, it's, uh, to me, the only moment in which the two communities are actually dialoguing, because uh, the Esselunga, the supermarket, is offering the watermelons, and the Chinese are actually organizing all the logistics and uh, offering food and so on, so it's a, it's a proper uh, collaboration. Um, my piece here uh, was, uh, was introduced by a workshop I decided to do with the uh, some stakeholders, uh, from uh, uh, the mayor to the cultural councillor, to the Chinese uh, uh, producer, uh, to uh, other people from, from Prato. I, I sent an official letter uh, of invitation, um, and I, uh, I sent a location, and I decided to uh, throw on the table this idea of reinventing or redesigning the Gonfalone. Uh, so I took the original flag of the city that was including the Lilium, which is the Gelfi family um, symbol, and uh, uh, the crown, and uh, which means city, and, uh, and the two uh, breast, uh, the two um, the two trees, which branches, which are olive tree and oak tree, that are normally uh, placed in every gonfalone uh, in Italy. I uh, basically took off from the gonfalone all the symbols, and I built uh, this vocabulary of, of symbols. Um, and then I just kicked off uh, and uh, uh, included some very, um, very renowned Chinese symbol just to start the conversation. And then I, uh, I decided to, to, to listen to what uh, uh, everyone was proposing. This uh, workshop resulted in a series of uh, proposals that were in the end condensed into one single flag. So people decided, for instance, to divide uh, the crest into parts, uh, to, to put uh, the idea of the Chinese boy, um, and also, again, to, uh, to put the, cut, the fortune cut, uh, <coughs> and uh, to include, uh, to change uh, the nature of, uh, of the bottom side with, with a different, uh, with a different uh, branches. And someone, uh, quite interestingly, proposed to take off the crown because Prato is no longer a city, it's a territory. And this, uh, of course, was included and I thought was uh, one of the strongest uh, points I got at that time. And um, what else? This is the cultural counselor who said uh, the Gonfalone is perfect like this, I'm um, doing it as it is. <laughs> uh, so basically, didn't really participate in the discussion, but uh, um, in the end, I decided to uh, basically mix all the, all the results I had. These were some trials. And uh, at the end, this is the final uh, gonfalone that was then produced by a company called La Nazionale, specialized in the production of uh, gonfaloni and any other uh, flag or Italian uh, crest. And these were the machine uh, for the production. And, uh, the drawings of the different layers. And this is the final result in which you see watermelons are protagonists, uh, a piece of half of the crest, uh, because I really believed uh, that uh, was really uh, the celebration, the moment in which 
uh, two communities were dialoguing, but also a moment of renovation uh, in an extremely traditional setting such as, uh, such as Prato. And uh, the Chinese lagoon uh, is on top of the crest to symbolize, instead of the, the crown, uh, just to symbolize the way, uh, the only way to, to browse around the city is to actually follow the dragoon during the Chinese New Year. And then again, one branch was replaced with another plant coming from the region where all the Chinese communities are coming from, um, the ones that were moved to Prato. And uh, we'll just conclude with this uh, earth shaking, which is the backside of, uh, of the Gonfalone. Thank you. So, uh, so the idea 
idea is to really question um, the use of public of, uh, spaces and objects uh, through a reflection of uh, their function. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Last question. Sorry, because I'm super curious about it. Uh, so your teachers, you don't see very much the uh, coexistence between the different cultures. You see, for example, uh, the last project, you see Chinese people, but not really so much Italian people involved in yes. And when you design the piece, you divide it completely in the middle of the two parts, if I can yes. just simplify it. Yes. So it is uh, the design piece, the design decision of making this craft that is not really a cross breeding, but it's a kind of coexistence in place, but again, divided into two fields, separated by. Um, is representing also what is happening in the place? Is, uh... So I would say that for Prato it's a bit of a tense, not a tense, but a very separated uh, life uh, between communities. So the, the strong uh, division of the Crescent 2, it's quite literally uh, mirroring uh, the situation. Okay. When you see, uh, for instance, the, the lenticular printing of Lara, it's, it's uh, completely the opposite. Everything is silently in place, uh, very smoothly. Uh, the mayor uh, is part of the celebration, actually offers uh, parts of the, also finances the festival. And uh, uh, the only pro problem, or let's say the only feature there, the characteristic there is that you can only see this uh, image once a year. Yeah. So the celebration is really the, 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 the manifesto of the situation. So, so during the week, uh, you don't see anyone now. It's really related to the festivity itself, yes. the event. Yes. Last question. Um, <laughs> where do you place yourself as, as a designer um, between the initial stage of the research and the study and then uh, the design itself? That means where, where do you stay uh, and how uh, further you go as a designer? Yes. The moment you, you ask yourself to design and to have an output uh, from the research you need. Okay, so I'm very slow. Yeah. I'm extremely slow. It takes me a very long time to process uh, the information. Also because I always deal with very complex, uh, a bit uh, controversial situations. And I try to, um, to give back an image of uh, simplicity or uh, let's say no, no, not much tension of uh, easiness. Uh, and I do that uh, trying to synthesize completely uh, what I see. So, for instance, from a very complex procedure of uh, research uh, regarding uh, the condition of sacred spaces belonging to different communities in Italy, which is extremely controversial, I then simply uh, produce uh, one single piece, which is the lenticular print, uh, which is actually a quite magic image of uh, a square uh, completely being revitalized and uh, filled uh, with uh, colorful uh, uh, elements. Uh, so, uh, mostly I try to synthesize what I see. Uh, secondly, I try to communicate it. Mm, so, I always try to use a media which corresponds to the media the community is using or is very close to the community, such as the reticular print is uh, actually used in the sick iconography. And third, I try to display it, so then I simply sometimes design the display, so which is basically the support. Uh, and then I wait for the audience, because I also believe somehow that the piece is not complete at the moment in which somebody sees it, because it's uh, actually a, communica a communication strategy in the end. Okay. Okay. I think we can stop Matilde here. Thank you Thank so you. much.